Call your live on here. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, uh, my name is Ed. I'm calling from Los Angeles. Uh, my question is, when when Jesus read, when, when Jesus was called in the Torah scroll, and he was reading the Torah, and uh, he was referring to is, uh, Isaiah, saying that uh, it has been fulfilled, the prophecy and all this, he misquoted Isaiah. So my question is, has he fulfilled the mitzvah of reading the Torah scroll properly? Thank you. <laughs> That's a great question. Love it. Yeah, so as it turns out, we don't have Jesus reading from the Torah scroll, uh, but rather we have him reading from the half Torah, which is a segment of the prophets. It's very famous. Uh, we're told this in the book of Luke, chapter 4, that Jesus was in the synagogue and he stepped up to read from the book of Isaiah. Just a little bit of background, uh, a custom, a tradition. You see, Jesus participated in Jewish customs. They're not biblical. Somehow that doesn't bother Christians in any event. During the time of Hanukkah, during that period, during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who sought to eradicate the Jewish faith, it was forbidden to read or to use a Torah. It was forbidden. It was illicit, punishable. And therefore, what did Jewish people do during this period, during, the, during this uh, oppression of our faith? So we, instead of reading from the Torah, we read from a section of the prophets that somehow correlated to what the weekly portion ought to be or what time of the year it was. Now, after the Antiochus Epiphany IV was gone, the Jews retained that rabbinic custom. I'm saying this because... You see, I'm just adding this little piece in. I think it has to be said. This this game that missionaries engage in, that we don't believe in rabbinic Judaism, we don't believe in rabbinic practices, we only believe in the Bible. Well, as it turns out, in the Christian Bible, we find a whole host of examples of where Jesus and the disciples are practicing rabbinic traditions. Like Jesus is named at a circumcision. That's a rabbinic tradition. Why at a circumcision? And this is another case. And somehow this doesn't register for Christians, and Christian apologists are perfectly willing and able to ignore all this. But that's not the point here. The point here that in Luke chapter 4, Jesus in a synagogue in Nazareth is called to read from the book of Isaiah, which means he's reading from the half Torah, a tradition at that time was less than 200 years old. Okay. Now, I don't think this happened. It could have occurred, but Luke is very make sure that Jesus does not read the text properly. And it's not that I'm trying to give Jesus a, a free pass on this. I don't think the story is historical. I, I think that the story is there in order to convey that Jesus is here to bring the good news and to, to shape the role of the Messiah into a miracle worker, which is not in Tanakh. So in, in, when you open up a Christian Bible, let's say you go to the book of Matthew, right? So in Matthew, Jesus' ministry really begins in Matthew chapter 4. In Mark, it's pretty much right after the baptism. And all, what you find in the Gospels is Jesus is performing an enormous amount of miracles. Now, what is the purpose of the miracles? So John and the synoptics disagree on that point. But what you find a lot is that Jesus just is a miracle worker. And of all the miracles that he's doing, healing the blind is like a is is very common. He's not only healing the blind, but that comes up a lot. You know, he, he, John chapter 9, it's all over the place, okay? So the problem is that when you read passages about the Messiah himself in Tanakh, you don't counter anything like that. 
what you find in the Hebrew Bible, when you we do have Mashiach described in the Hebrew Scriptures, but there's nothing there about him performing miracles, nothing about him healing blind people, nothing. Not, not, what you do find is he gives haychacha, which means he gives rebuke to the nations. He teaches Torah. There are like six passages in Isaiah chapter 2 that describe him doing this. Same thing in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10. He's rebuking the nations. He's judging people, not after the sight of his eyes. See Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, 2, and 3. But rather, in the Christian Bible, Jesus is doing what we see other mythical figures doing at that time and they're just going around healing everybody. Not only that, but you have emperors of Rome that are recorded by uh, Josephus, by Pliny, as healing the blind and, and, and healing the lame. Same kind of thing. The point is that a Messiah going around healing people is not found in the Jewish Bible. That is not to say that the Messiah, please God, he'll come soon, will actually not do a miracle. Maybe he will. I don't know. But it's very important to Tanakh to convey that that's not his role. But rather his role is to rebuke, to strengthen people so that people will repent and then do tshuva and will turn back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and war will come to an end. And the reason why war comes to an end in Tanakh just is very important point. So the war coming to an end is very important, whether it's Zechariah 9.10, whether it's Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 through 4, whether it's Isaiah chapter 11. The reason why war comes to an end when people turn to one religion and one God is, in the view of Tanakh, War is generally the result of clashing ideologies. But once the whole world believes the exact same thing, believes in one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so war will come to an end. That's why they're always directly, explicitly connected. Now, let's go to the let's go to Luke chapter four on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, not on Sunday, on Shabbat goes to the synagogue, and he's called up. The book of Isaiah is open to him. And incidentally, what's not open to him is a Septuagint. You know, this idea that has filled your brain, the marrow of your bones that in the New Testament it's the Septuagint's being quoted. You see right here he's reading from a scroll of the book of Isaiah. He's not reading from a Septuagint. In fact, the Septuagint is never mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. This point about the Septuagint is going to become very important in a moment. And then he begins to quote. Now, he's quoting Isaiah. What he's about to quote, which I'm going to read to you now, is not a prophecy of the future. It's Isaiah speaking in the first person about himself and what his role is, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. I'm going to read to you the way it's, it appears in the book of Luke. He sent me to proclaim a release to the captives and a recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are bruised. Now, as it turns out, if we go back to the book of Isaiah, I think you have an idea of what you're not going to find. I mean, think about it for a moment. After you've heard me explain that we don't have anything about the Messiah performing miracles without even looking at Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and that's what the quote is from, which part of that do you think is manufactured? Which part is an interpolation? What segment, what comma, what clause in this text do you think from the book of Luke is an interpolation was put in later. And I'm sure you figured it out by now that when you go back to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, even if you use a Christian Bible, it's going to say there that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God anointed me to bring the good news to the poor, and he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open the prison to those who are bound. Okay? What don't you hear there? There's nothing there about healing the blind. 
So the healing the blind part that you find in Luke chapter 4 is an interpolation. It's a corruption. It was done by the church in order to make it appear as though the good news in this term good news is where the term good news and gospel comes from. Uh, but the idea is to somehow save Christianity, <laughs> to rescue Christianity from the problem of that its message is inconsistent with the Hebrew Bible, and that is to insert a, a Christology where it doesn't appear. And all you have to do is if you have a Christian Bible in front of you, you can just open it up on one part of the page, open it up to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and then on the other side, look, look at Luke chapter 4, verse 18. You can open up two browsers side by side, and you can see immediately that the healing of the blind does not appear anywhere in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Isaiah is speaking in the first person about himself. So what you have, this is very frequently done, is that texts that are someone is speaking, Isaiah in this case is speaking to us, is then taken and misappropriated about this is the mis Jesus speaking. Fine. So whatever. But here you see one thing is you see that the healing of the blind was important to the book of Luke to insert that in. Now we get even nuttier because as I've shared with you in the past, the Septuagint that you buy on Amazon, that is a product of the church. What the church did was the original Septuagint that was uh, composed about 2,270 years ago okay, was only the five books of Moses. This is what you you will never be told this in church. Never. It just is not going to happen, okay? And those of you who have been to church know this has never occurred. You will never be told by your pastor or priest, by your minister, that the original Septuagint was only five books of Moses. Why does the church hide that information from you? They know it's true. I mean, the scholars know it's true. I mean, Jerome concedes that in his introduction to the book of Chronicles. It, we know that. You can read the preface to the King James Version, and it goes through all the kind of stuff I'm telling you now, but no one reads the KJV's preface, meaning the preface done by the King James translators. In the beginning, they explained the whole deal with the Septuagint, and that's why they translated Hebrew. They didn't translate the Septuagint. Jerome also knew that the Septuagint was corrupted, heavily corrupted, by earlier uh, Christians um, like Origen, who lived a century, more than a century before Jerome. So what happened is the, Sep the original Septuagint just the five books of Moses. Subsequently, many people started translating the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, into the Greek language. Many, many people did. And people were correcting each other and so on. And the church began engaging in this cottage industry. And the person who, is, who knew Hebrew, the person who was most responsible for our version of the Septuagint, which is one of many, many, because everyone kept retaining the name Septuagint. Like imagine there are hundreds of translations of the Bible into English, right? It's not just the King James. They were translations that predated the King James. The Geneva Bible, the Tyndale Bible, they're all older. But imagine if the NIV, which was done in the last century, just called itself the King James. That would really be confusing. But that's what happened. So everyone kept calling it Septuagint because that was the brand. And then the church would then interpolate whatever was necessary, corrupt whatever passages were essential in order to back up, in order to bolster the New Testament corruption. So it's not that the New Testament was quoting from the Septuagint. That's nonsense. And here in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, you see clearly he's reading from a scroll of Isaiah, we are told. He's not reading from a Septuagint. I mean, here it's explicit. And now we can see the extent that the church would go to to alter the Jewish scriptures 
in order to make it appear Christological. In the very famous verse, here's the verse where we're told like the good news is being delivered. And in that very verse, this is interpolated into the Septuagint so that the Septuagint of Isaiah 61 verse 1 comports with Luke chapter 4 verse 18. How do you change the Bible? How do you play games like this? And if you're going to engage in this kind of uh, Bible tampering, do you think I'm going to convert to Christianity? Do you think I'm going to abandon my faith in God? I'm going to get baptized? You should be going to your churches and asking for a refund. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> I met many Christians in my life who, who are so angry. They gave so much money to the church, and they, they want to go back and say, I want my money back. But the church really has ripped you off on this. Not necessarily your pastor. Your pastor gets this from his seminary. But this is the way it's taught, and this is how the texts were, uh, were altered, tampered in a way. Th these are bad faith actors. Anyways, thank you for that question. I don't know אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כבלות הכל Levador, Imloch Noah.